Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. So in this video, I want to talk to you about a subject that has been coming a lot up lately on Rocket Lab Weeklies. And that is the fear that Starship is going to be a very serious competitor to Rocket Lab and Rocket Lab is not going to survive. And the other one is that uh, when Starship is developed, then SpaceX is going to have a bunch of Falcon 9s that are unusable and they are probably just going to discount the crap out of those vehicles and thereby rendering Rocket Lab's Neutron um, basically completely unviable. So I want to dedicate this video to answering that question with mostly my thoughts and my beliefs on the space industry. Uh, so this is my answer to those questions and why I think Rocket Lab is going to compete very well with Starship and Falcon 9. So thank you so much for watching. Please make sure that you are subscribed. And I want to give special thanks to these four people who have recently become uh, channel members. It's amazing that you guys help support the channel. It really makes my days. I also have some Patreon members that I completely disrespected by <laughs> not showing their names. It's coming in the next video. But thank you so much. It's really appreciated. So uh, I did a little bit of research that I want to share with you, but this is based on my understanding of the space uh, industry. So developing a rocket is something of a moat. And it's a huge, huge, huge moat. And I do believe it's true uh, what Peter Beck and Adam Spice have been talking about, that the age of new uh, rocket companies is really closing. And there is not going to be a lot more um, rocket, lab com rocket, lab, no, rocket companies coming in the future. And there's a reason to that. And that has to do with moats. So it's crazy expensive to develop a rocket. So every new entry who has to come into the space, they have to risk a crap ton of capital. Uh, I'm just going to show you how much that, that capital is. Uh, and after that, when you have a developed rocket, uh, it's relatively cheap to uh, you know, keep flying with that rocket and optimize that, that rocket. And if you, on top of it, can make your rocket uh, reusable, uh, then it's then you can discount your rocket to unbelievable levels to keep out uh, competitors. So how much is this mode? So let's start with the Falcon 9. So the Falcon 9 in 2006, so that's soon 20 years ago. Um, no, sorry, I messed up the date. So that was the Falcon 1. So in 2011, SpaceX, so that's only a mere uh, decade ago, um, they estimated Falcon 9 development cost to be four, 300 million. So that is SpaceX who are hyper capital efficient and that is 10 years of inflation ago. Uh, now Rocket Lab on Neutron, which is a Falcon 9 uh, competitor, they're planning to develop uh, that one, and I hope they succeed, from between 250 to 300 million. So keep in mind that this is maybe not such a mind-boggling number, but this just shows you how crazy uh, capital efficient Rocket Lab is with the capital that they're given. So I want to remind you that Falcon 9 uh, was also an insanely capital um efficient company 10 years ago was 300 million. So logically with inflation and, you know, a, a lot of different things, um, the cost realistically today should be four, five, 600 million. Okay. And let's look at how other companies are doing it because as again, um, Rocket Lab is insanely efficient with their capital. So I Googled how much funding did other Rocket Lab competitors get? We all are very familiar with Relativity Space. They have spent or have gotten 1.3 billion in funding and they don't have a working rocket yet. Uh, Firefly Aerospace, it doesn't have the numbers here, but I remember that it's also in the four, 500 million that they have gotten in financing and they have not really developed the rocket. I think they had one successful flight and three uh, flight uh, failures. So, and then here we go to the real kingpin, Starship. So the development cost of Starship is between five 
to 10 billion. So once Starship is operational in its class, which is about 150 tons uh, to low Earth orbit, and that one is reusable for any new comers to come into this space, they need to be able to invest and risk five to $10 billion with really a high chance of failure. And then on top of it, they probably need to optimize uh, the vehicle a lot to be able to just compete and not even have a guaranteed success with Starship and other existing rockets. So it's a huge, huge moat. Luckily, this uh, Starship is not here yet. And so there is a little bit of window for Rocket Lab to develop Neutron. The second thing is uh, that one of the biggest customers currently in space is the US government, and they have the stated uh, intention to have multiple space vendors that they can use. So Space Force and NASA are not a fan of basically transferring their budget into SpaceX. They want to see a vibrant space economy uh, with competition and they are hell-bent on this, and this almost guarantees that Rocket Lab is going to be able to go through the development phase of uh, Neutron, and they are able to lay out this 250 to 300 million, develop the vehicle, uh, make it reusable, and you know that way it basically finances Rocket Lab through this insane hurdle, and once the rocket is ready, again, it will cost very little and there will be a lot of other customers uh, available. So now the second thing that many people are not thinking with uh, is that the Falcon 9 and Neutron are going to serve a slightly different market. And a lot of people have a hard time thinking with um, that, yes, the Falcon 9 is cheaper to price per kilogram. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's your cheapest alternative because let's say, the, not let's say, the Falcon 9 can take 24 tons to low Earth orbit and Neutron can take 17 tons to low Earth orbit. The Falcon 9 costs between 60 to 80 uh, million. The Neutron costs, uh, I think, between 50 to 55 million. That's what it's going to cost. So let's say you have a satellite that is uh, 10 tons. So it can fit both the Falcon and both Neutron. So I bet you as a CFO, you're not going to care that the Falcon 9 is giving you the cheapest kilogram uh, per ton to space when you're not using 100% of the vehicles. So you're going to have to pay 60 million on the Falcon 9 to launch your 10 million um, 10 ton satellite or 55 million on Rocket Lab's Neutron. You're going to take the 5 million cheaper option any day of the week. And again, I know a lot of people are going to say, but yeah, Vince, but Falcon 9 can undercut Rocket Lab. But guess what? Once Rocket Lab is through the development phase, they can also undercut themselves and really, uh, you know, compete on the price because the big cost is developing the vehicle and making it reusable. Uh, then a third thing that people are not keeping in mind is that uh, SpaceX is a $200 billion gigantic behemoth of a company. Rocket Lab is a $2 billion company. Uh, SpaceX has had probably 99% of the space industry and Rocket Lab doesn't need to put a huge dint into that to become a $4 billion even a 10 billion company, okay? For SpaceX to grow, it's a much, much harder thing. And I'm gonna illustrate this uh, by, you're, you're gonna see what, what I'm coming to this. So another point that people are not thinking with uh, is time to flight. So SpaceX Falcon 9, the transporter missions, which is the ones where, you know, smaller satellites are grouped together, and that's probably a very, I, I, I'm guessing that that's a better price that the satellites are getting than they're getting on the Electron rocket. So the Electron rocket is about 8 million per launch. Again, the Falcon 9 is uh, 60 million per launch, but if they can launch, uh, you know, 30, 40 satellites together, maybe each satellite just needs to pay $3 million. So why hasn't it killed Electron? It hasn't killed Electron because these missions are sold two, three, four years ahead. And if you're a space startup and you need to get your 
stuff in space, you cannot, you don't have financing to wait two years uh, for a Falcon 9 rocket for $3 million because the just the wait is going to cost you way more than you will save on Electron. So it's much better to contract uh, Electron and Rocket Lab and get a launch date in, you know, two to three months and off you go, you can, you know, prove out your proof of concept, then you can, you know, get more funding. Uh, so this is one aspect that people are not thinking with. The second aspect is that Rocket Lab is trying to be an end-to-end -end space company. I'm really, really sure that how the space industry works today is if I am Amazon and I want to have the Kuiper satellites, I need to contract a satellite manufacturer. It's probably like I need to uh, contract a satellite uh, bus manufacturer, a satellite payload manufacturer, and then they can subcontract a lot of guys under them. And then it's margin stacking, like you have to pay for the margin of the satellite bus provider, then the satellite payload provider and all of their subcontractors. There's a lot of added time because, you know, the satellite bus needs to be produced. Uh, the payload needs to be produced, they need to be shipped to a new place where they need to be tested, then they need to be integrated. And then on top of it, you need to contract launch. And then once you have contracted a, a launch provider who is also stacking their margin, then you need to ship the satellite there. And then those guys need to retest everything and it just adds a lot of time. But instead, you will be able to contract Rocket Lab who is able to manufacture your bus, it's able to manufacture your payload, and it's going and it's able to launch it. And what did I tell you? Time is money. And most probably when Rocket Lab would offer this package deal, they can, you know, give much more favorable prices to uh, the customers. And I, I'm not even sure that these favorable prices are needed for the customers because just the time savings and the efficiency and the guarantee that they can keep the schedule because they're not dependent on solar cell providers or reaction wheel providers, which, which, which are big bottlenecks uh, in the space industry. So I think that they will win a lot of contracts on that. And now the final point uh, on this is just how little Rocket Lab needs to sell Neutron so that it's a serious increase for Rocket Lab is we're planning one test flight this year. We're planning, I'm hoping for three neutron flights next year. And just to keep that in context, probably the NSSL uh, phase uh, trench three will probably can take up all of neutron for those first three launches. So that's one customer, one launch takes up all the neutron capacity. Okay. Uh, then if, Rocket Lab pulls in a huge order, like the, the Kuiper order from Amazon. Uh, this is also a, a, a concept that a lot of people don't understand. And in the old space, uh, we were shooting up satellites into geostationary transfer or, or geostationary Earth orbit, which is about 36,000 kilometers away from Earth. And you can see that the satellite is static because it's moving at the same speed as Earth is turning. And these satellites are normally used to cover basically one side of Earth. And you maybe need two or three or maybe max four satellites to cover all of Earth uh, with something. So the problem with this is that it's really expensive to get stuff out there. Uh, you can't service the stuff. Uh, it's pretty much if you send something there, it stays there forever. And the modus operandi of the past has been that you spent uh, many billions of dollars and five years to develop a satellite. And by the time you developed the satellite, it was obsolete. And then you sent it up and you were expecting it to be operational for 20, 30 years. And can you imagine how much technology changes over that time? So instead in the new space industry that was heralded in by uh, the Falcon 1, uh, Leo has become an option because it's so cheap to launch that you can launch a lot of satellites that are much smaller. And instead of, you know, having this five year design time, you can design your satellites in a few months. It takes you another few months to uh, manufacture them. And then it's very cheap to launch them. But here you still have a little bit of atmosphere. So that's, um, 
disadvantage number one. And disadvantage number two is that here you're rotating every two, three hours um, around Earth. So you can only observe a very small part of Earth. So this is why you need this humongous constellations of thousands and maybe tens of thousands of satellites that all the time uh, basically cover every part of Earth. Uh, but these satellites are much cheaper again, uh, but because of the atmosphere, they have a little bit of drag. And so they have to course correct all the time to stay in this low Earth orbit. And uh, the fuel runs out in three to five years, maybe seven years, and then those satellites reorbit. So if you have a constellation that is 6,000 satellites and you're shooting up a thousand satellites per year, most probably after year six, your constellation is complete, but the first ones that you, uh, you know, deployed, they will be starting to deorbit. So you have to continuously make those satellites, shoot them up, and then you have to constantly replenish these constellations. So if Rocket Lab just gets the Amazon order, let's say, it would take probably six to eight to maybe 10 uh, neutron launches per year, all the time, every year, because they're just the supplier of that constellation. And Amazon, for example, is not a company that would, you know, bring this production in house. Uh, so they will be a very long term, very loyal uh, customers for Rocket Lab. And again, this is, again, a case of just one customer finding value with Rocket Lab and taking up years and years of capacity of uh, Neutron. So I think that you need to be zero scared that Neutron is uh, not going to sell well. I think that it's going to be a crunch and they are not going to be able to make enough of Neutrons, regardless of what the price of Falcon 9 and Starships are going to be. They serve slightly different markets, um, so you don't need to be worried. That's the main conclusion of the video. Please let me know what you thought. Uh, let me know if this video was useful to you. Did I ease your worry? Did I change your mind? Or you still think that uh, Rocket Lab is going to zero once Starship is developed? So thank you so much for watching. Uh, please consider joining the channel membership or the Patreon if you want to support the channel. And I'll see you in the next video. Ciao, ciao.